up to the volunteers accompany the family members of a passenger on the missing Malaysia plane to the hospital for treatment. We take a look at the history of Taiwan's Yuli City Hospital and see how it safeguards local residents' health. Welcome to Dar Headlines. I'm Helen Liao. Thank you for joining us in Malaysia as the search continues for the missing flight MH370. Tiji volunteers have already been mobilized to offer emotional support to family members who recently arrived in Kuala Lumpur to wait for further news. On the early morning of March 10th, the wife of one missing passenger who had not eaten or slept in two days had a spasm. Thankfully, with the help of Tiji volunteers, the woman was taken to the hospital and was later released. In the early morning of March 10th, the wife of one of the missing passengers having not eaten or slept in 48 hours went into a spasm in her hotel room. Upon hearing the news, the volunteers quickly gathered to accompany the woman to the hospital. This morning, the woman's daughter rushed out of their room asking for help. She thought her mother had had a stroke. After medical personnel at the hotel gave her a quick checkup, she was sent to the emergency room of a nearby hospital. After a thorough examination, the doctors diagnosed the spasm as a result of fatigue. With such unexpected situations to be more common as tensions build, Tzu volunteer Tian Jingxiang reminds her counterparts to be extra cautious with tending to family members. Right now, many of the family members are emotionally unstable. They may say a lot of negative things or hurtful words. I hope all Tiji brothers and sisters can remember not to take the negativity personally. With Master Zheng Yin's words of wisdom in mind, Tiji volunteers promise to continue providing warmth and emotional support to family members as they face this tragedy in the days ahead. Among the 12 crew members on board the missing Malaysian plane, one was the parents of a student at City Star Kindergarten in Malaysia. On March 10th, five volunteers and teachers visited the husband and mother of the crew member and were sad to see that her four-year-old son is still waiting for his mother's return. Seeing the arrival of the city volunteers, Mr. Lee can't help but let go of his bottled-up emotions. Mr. Lee's wife was one of the crew members on board the missing plane, thus the last 72 hours have been extremely difficult for him and his family. <laughs> Crying her heart out is the mother of the crew member who hasn't had much sleep since the incident. I can come to terms with what has happened. I can't cry in front of my son-in-law because he still has a child to take care. I'm really heartbroken. Looking at his family photo, the four-year-old son has no idea that the flight his mother was on is missing and is particularly happy to see his teacher visiting. The boy's cheerful nature has these adults even more depressed. Near the end of their visits, the husband of the missing crew member asked volunteers to lead his family in prayer for the safe return of his wife. Inspired by Tzu's work following the disappearance of Fly MH370, students at the Capital University of Economics and Business in Beijing, China, decided to take a day off from school to help. Explaining to those in the room how to fill in the passport application forms, these are the students at the Capital University of Economics and Business in Beijing, China. Today, many of them are taking a day off from school to volunteer. The school gave me a day off, but they will deduct one credit from my overall mark. As a university student, especially a member of the society, I think it is my duty to contribute. With the guidance and support from city volunteers, these students quickly learned how to fill in the passport application forms without a hitch. 
Sichi volunteers taught us how to complete passport application forms and also coordinate everything for us. Inspired by Tsuji volunteers' selfless dedication, in just one day, more than seven people from all walks of life decided to join the Buddhist NGO. March 11th marked the third anniversary of the 311 earthquake and tsunami in Japan. To commemorate those who lost their lives in the disasters, the Umi no Sato Foundation organized a photography exhibition and charity fair in Kamakura City, to which they invited the Tsuji Japan chapter to take part. As volunteers walk participants through each picture, the painful memories of the 311 earthquake and tsunami come flooding back. To mark the third anniversary of the disaster, the Umi no Sato Foundation organized a photography exhibition and charity fair, and taking part at the foundation's request was also the Tsuji Japan chapter. Immediately after the 311 earthquake and tsunami, Tsuji volunteers from Taiwan arrived at the disaster site in Tohoku to help, but it seems many Japanese people do not know that. Hence, as a token of our gratitude, we invited Tsuji to take part in our photography exhibition so that our citizens can see what Taiwan did for us in Japan. In preparation for the charity event, volunteers began purchasing ingredients a week before, as everyone hopes to contribute a little of their strength to help the residents of Tohoku. This photography exhibition is to remind people of the 311 disaster, and right now there are still many people suffering in Tohoku. This charity event is to raise funds for Tohoku and support its economic recovery. Taiwan raised the most donations for the 311 earthquake. I'm happy that Taiwan, especially Tsuji, is committed to carrying out relief efforts. I have no doubt that the Japanese people are truly grateful for their efforts. The two-day event not only included photography exhibits, the event organizers also invited Taiwanese Erhu player Liao Pei Yu to perform. The atmosphere here is very calming. It's not like your typical stage, which is cold and distant. The whole setup here makes me feel at ease. For residents of Tohoku, 311 is a painful day to remember. However, with the unfaltering love of Tiji volunteers, their pain will one day surely heal. Here in Taiwan, fossil fuel energy accounts for nearly 70% of the nation's electricity usage. However, this form of energy also produces a large amount of carbon dioxide. And in face of global warming, we find out what exactly Taiwan's government is doing to reduce its carbon footprint. Looking at this power plant's giant chimneys, one can see an almost invisible gas being released. It produces carbon dioxide and nitrogen oxides. So far, we do not have the right technology to monitor the concentration level of carbon dioxide on the spot. Colorless and tasteless, yet carbon dioxide is said to be the culprit behind global warming. Power plants are major sources of carbon emissions in Taiwan. The burning of fossil fuels accounts for 72.6% of the total electricity production in Taiwan. In other words, most of the electricity used in our daily lives come from fossil fuels, which in turn produces carbon footprints. According to a survey by Taiwan's Environmental Protection Administration, 65% of the island CO2 is produced by the industrial sector, while another 16% is generated by vehicles. The highest CO2 concentration level recorded 
was some 400 ppm, which was the highest it's been over the last tens of thousands of years. In May 2013, EPA officially listed CO2 as a source of air pollution, which means it can be regulated when concentration levels reach a certain point. In response, the Taizong power plant replaced its old coal-fired units to reduce its carbon footprints. To lead by example, the Taizong city government also purchased 64 electric vehicles. Low using electric vehicles will not produce CO2. The problem is that the electricity still came from fossil fuels or nuclear energy. To find a greener form of energy that does not produce CO2, experts suggest using renewable resources such as wind and solar power. Today, many developing countries have implemented regulations aimed at businesses that produce a large amount of carbon footprint as a way to remind them of the responsibility they have towards our planet. Here in Taiwan, similar rules are about to take effect. The tax collected through this levy will be an effective economic measurement for those that emit large amounts of carbon dioxide to think of ways to reduce their carbon footprint. To get to the root of the problem, besides developing renewable energy sources, we must also reduce energy usage. There are 1.78 million street lights in Taiwan, and if we change all of them to LED lights, we will be able to save 700 million kilowatts of electricity annually. The increasing concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere has been a major factor in climate changes around the globe. It seems that only when we change our way of life will we be able to make a difference in this battle to save our planet. Following the end of the simulated surgery program at the Tsiji University in Hualien, Taiwan, on March 10, a John Momoa survey was organized for all eight salamentors. <laughs> On March 10th, Hualien City University held a memorial service for eight silent mentors after the completion of the university's simulated surgery course. <laughs> Expressing their sadness, students placed bouquets and cars on top of the casket. Through his participation, Nagahori Katsuya, a Tsuching from Japan, says he has not only gained invaluable experience, but also seen firsthand the true spirit of selfless giving. Thank you to the silent mentors and their family members. Thank you to the Tsuji aunts and uncles and fellow students. This course inspired me to be a better doctor. One of the silent mentors was Tai Shu Zhu, whose wish of giving after death was finally fulfilled. Tai was in the trade business with her husband in Xiamen, China, and was also a died mother to many students. We are happy that she was able to fulfill her wish of being a silent mentor. I think I will try to continue participating in Siji events and do her part as well. Alongside these silent mentors on the last leg of their journey, the medical students now shoulder the responsibility of curing the sick and poor. After the service, a ceremony was held to honor the eight bodhisattvas. Amid the solemn singing, countless unsaid gratitude was conveyed. As a medical student, we should not allow the wounds on the side of mentors' bodies to be made in vain. We need to spread this mentor's love further by curing the ailments of all sentient beings. That is the best way we can repay them for their great love. To fulfill his wish of becoming a silent mentor, during his final stage of cancer, Hong Chunji entered into the palliative ward and signed a do not resuscitate form. He then took better care of his body and worked towards being a suitable donor. Please don't give up on your field of expertise, because my father can only die once. He can't donate his body a second time. Please do your best. Photographs of the silent mentors are shown during the ceremony, and although they are no longer in the world physically, their spirit remains forever. I think my grandfather's great love is just like his name, Yongfa. It will forever shine and continues to shine on in our hearts. After the cremated remains are placed inside the urn, 
The silent mentors are safely interred inside Siji's Great Giving Hall. Thanks to the selfless givings of these bodhisattvas, these medical students are now on their way to becoming a more compassionate and kind doctor. Since opening its door in 1999, the Yu Li Zijie Hospital has been serving the residents of Eastern Taiwan for over 15 years. Further improving on its range of services, in 2003, the hospital opened the region's first 24-hour emergency unit that has saved tens of thousands of lives since its establishment. <laughs>他到院前的时候已经是那个属于心脏脉搏血压都是零的状态 in September 2003, Uli Tiji Hospital added a 24-hour emergency unit to its list of medical services, thereby offering an important lifeline for those in critical condition. When a patient needs it, that is when we should be able to provide them with care. And to do this, we needed to offer a 24-hour emergency service. Not long after the ER unit came online, a car accident victim with life-threatening injuries was transferred from Guanshan Tsuji Hospital to Yuli Tsuji Hospital. She came in with trauma to the head and brain, and she was also in a coma. Zhang Yuling, who was vice superintendent of the hospital at the time, was on shift when the 11-year-old girl was brought in. Seeing her condition, he ordered immediate surgery. Everyone said that sending me to Uli would result in too much blood loss and death. Who knew that I would survive? It is pretty amazing when you think about it. Su Yijin was the first patient to undergo brain surgery at Uli Tsuji Hospital. That was 11 years ago. It's pretty amazing. In this small town which is in a pretty isolated area, there's a hospital that not only can offer brain surgery, but save lives with such procedure. Thanks to it, I'm here today. In September 2005, chicken farmer Mr. Wang was brought to the Uli Tiji Hospital unconscious with what was assumed to be a case of bad heat stroke. I remember it clearly. When he came in, he was unconscious. After test, we found that it was not due to heat stroke, but a cerebral aneurysm. Wang was also extremely lucky in that the Uli Tiji Hospital was then the only non-metro hospital in Taiwan with doctors who could operate on cerebral aneurysms. We gave him a CT scan which showed us the state of the blood vessels in the brain and from that we were able to discover the aneurysm. As for the surgery itself, some doctors compare it to demanding a minefield as it is easy for an aneurysm to burst during surgery, which can be very dangerous. The Uli Tiji Hospital today remains the only medical provider in the region that offers such advanced medical procedures, but the cost of keeping an ER unit fully staffed 24 hours a day is more than many realize. We always keep at least two doctors on call in the unit. As a result, the hospital is usually making a loss of one million U.S. dollars a year. However large the cost, with over 120,000 lives saved since the beginning of its operation, the Uli Tiji Hospital has no plans to curtail its ER services, which have become a mainstay of medical care in the Hualien Taidong Valley. In China, Shuizhou, we meet a family of four generations at the Shangong Jing Dai village who all happily live under the same roof. Tending to the fire in the wood stove and adding firewood from time to time, this is a task that rests squarely on the shoulders of 60-year-old Cai Shenxian. This is because tending to his mother's daily needs is his most important duty. When I have money in the future, I will buy the hot water heater so my mom can always have hot water for a bath, for washing her feet, her hair and clothes.
His 106-year-old mother gave birth to 11 children. Tai Xunxian is the youngest of the 11 and also the most filial. Tai left home to join the army when he was young. Returning home, he realized that his mother had grown old and decided to stay by her side. When I don't see my mother, I feel unsettled. Why is that? It's because when we were younger, she always took good care of us. She also helped to care for my children and my family. The Chinese New Year is the centenarian's happiest time of year, as it is a time when her children, grandchildren and great-grandchildren reunite for the holidays. Tai and his son stay indoors with the senior as they don't want to miss out on the opportunity to spend quality time with her. The time will come when my mother will pass on. I don't know what I will do when that time comes. I think about it every night and I can fall asleep for hours. I keep thinking of how I can repay my mother's grace. Tai Shunxian's filial piety has set an example for his son, Tai Dengcheng, who despite pursuing his dreams, always puts his family first. Although not wealthy, for this four-generation family, the filial piety is the most precious family heirloom. Moving back to Taiwan, we meet Tainan Tzuji Elementary School teacher Li Yanhui, who says watching Master Jingyin's Wisdom Up Down broadcast every morning has helped her deal with the precious in her life with a positive mindset. <laughs> Paying respects to the Buddha, Li Yanhui, starts her day at the Tsuji Anping Liaison Office watching Master Jinyan's Wisdom at Dawn broadcast. Thanks to the routine, her heart and mind are now at ease and no longer restless. Last September, I was under much stress because I had received my own class to take care of, so sometimes I'd wake up really early and not be able to fall back to sleep. I thought, why not visit the liaison office since I'm up anyways? A homeroom teacher from Tainan City Elementary School, Li Yanhui's daily participation in the initiative has helped her face the pressures of being an educator. The daily exposure to the correct ideals can help us to deal with our students when we are tested by them. When an obstacle arises, the master's wisdom will float into my mind and I can apply what she has taught me. Tucking the Dharma in her heart, Li Yanhui is frequently the first to arrive at school. She often incorporates what she has learned into her lessons on character and morals. Sometimes I'll remember a story that will fit into their daily lesson, and I will share it with them. Then I will also include some ideals to follow as well. Li not only shares the wisdom with her students, but also uses it to reflect on her own behavior. Mostly, it is my own emotions, like when anger is about to arise or how to handle students in certain situations. These are all areas that I am working on. Rising early to watch Wisdom at Dawn cleanses and broadens one's heart. In facing the stress of educating her students, Li Yanghui has learned to fully use the Dharma to help her become a more understanding and compassionate teacher. We go back to Malaysia at the end of the show. In Johobaru, students at the Tsuji Kindergarten, staff members at the local Jingzi Books and Cafe, and students of the Penang Tsuji Academy pray for those on the missing flight MH370. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for tuning in. Goodbye. <laughs>